Good evening. It's good to see you tonight. It's good to be with you. As we think about some things that hopefully will direct our hearts in serving God in a better way. We want this evening to tie together a couple of thoughts from this morning as we consider preparing our heart or setting our heart to seek the law of the Lord. One of the things that we talked about this morning, one of the questions that we asked as we considered the glorified Savior writing to the churches, writing letters, thinking about what he might say to us, one of the questions that we asked was, or that he might ask us is, how's your heart? How's your heart? And as we consider that question, all of us can only answer that, each, each one of us in and of ourselves. And tonight I want to think with you about how we might answer that question. For us to answer that question in a way that might be pleasing to him, we must first prepare ourselves and prepare our heart. And anytime we start to think about how we might do something like that when we find one of those probing questions in God's Word and we consider how it affects our spiritual lives, a good way to answer that question, to see how to go about those things is to, of course, look towards God's Word and see is there a, is there a faithful man or woman who has answered this call before. How can we follow after that? And this, morning, this, this evening, as we begin to think about these things, if you'll think about Ezra with me for just a moment. Over in Ezra, uh, the book of Ezra, chapter 7 and verse 10, we find this statement made about Ezra. And we're going to kind of use this as a basis for some of the things that we'll discuss together tonight. It says, therefore, Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Depending what version you read from, it might say there that Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. The same idea is there, and that's what we want to, to think about together tonight. In this verse, we find a very interesting comment about Ezra. And you remember that Ezra was instrumental in bringing a remnant back from Babylonian captivity to the city of Jerusalem to carry out a series of religious reforms, to help restore some things. This was about 458 B.C. when he was making this journey. And it says here about him in the midst of the book of Ezra that he had set his heart, or he had prepared his heart and as you and I think about that let's just let's make it real let's make it practical what does this mean when we ourselves consider that we are preparing for something you can probably think of lots of things as as can I we're we are adamantly trying to get our house ready to sell and there's lots of things to do and and as I think about some of those things, for years we've talked about putting in some sidewalks. We live out in the country, it hasn't been a big priority yet, but to sell the house we need a way to get in and out of the house that others who might want to buy it would like to have. And so as I think about that, I've been in construction for a while and I've seen people do concrete work, though I haven't done it myself. And I could get a concrete truck to come up to the house and start pouring concrete on the ground and eventually would harden and you could walk on it, but that's really not preparing to do something in the best way that it needs done, is it? I need to put forth some effort. I need to put forth the work to, to plan it out, to draw the lines, to see where it is that it's going to go, to level it out, to dig out, to set the forms, and then I'm ready to go ahead and, and to pour that concrete. And you can imagine the difference of what it would look like if I didn't prepare, if I just did it. And as we begin to think about this idea of preparing our heart, I hope that you'll start to make some application that serving God and being a faithful follower of him and being able to ask the question that Jesus might ask, how's your heart, takes some preparation. It's not just waking up one day and deciding, well, I'm going, I'm going to be a servant of God and that's all there is to it and, I'm, and just kind of throwing ourselves into it because Satan has something to say about that and he wants to throw us off track. We need to be able to to be a prepared people. And consider those who, who are running races. And let's make a more, uh, a better application of this. There may be someone out there who is a marathon runner. I know some of you have talked about going and running half marathons or full marathons. And, and you're a regular runner and you're prepared to do that. But what if the marathon that you've been asked to run is in Denver, Colorado? One mile above sea level. You can't just get off the plane and get out there, even though you're an experienced runner, and start running without having some problems. 
you have to prepare for that, don't you? You have to take the time to adjust to the altitude, maybe change your diet, change how you would breathe in order to be able to do that. Or you think about how we might go about cooking. There's some people here that are good cooks and get into doing things like that. What happens if you just start throwing ingredients together? You might end up with something that resembles what you were aiming for, but sometimes there's preparation time. And I think you can see where we're going with this. In all of these different ideas, preparation takes time. Preparation is necessary. And it is no different, brethren, when it comes to serving God. If we won't take the time to prepare ourselves and to prepare our heart to do these things, we're going to have a harder time and possibly we may fail in what it is that we're trying. It's interesting when you think about Ezra here, and as we find this common in chapter 7, Ezra was an older man, Ezra was a righteous man, but yet it shows us why he was who he was. Even a man of his experience, it said he had set his heart, he had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to study it. And we can take something from that. We find all throughout God's word the idea of preparation and why it's important. The young are instructed to prepare themselves. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. There's the idea of preparing when you're able so that you're able to stand when there's difficulty. And all of us need to think about that. Parents are told to prepare their children's heart as they grow and as they get older. Um, it says, looks like I left that one out, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Ephesians 6 and verse 4, it says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. There's the idea again of setting a mind, setting a heart on a path, and preparing them for what's coming in the future. Parents understand the need for this. If you have children or you had children for for any length of time, and you want your children to speak a certain way, you want them to say please and thank you, you want them to respect others, you want them to be able to sit still, you want them to, to be able to do a certain sport or to, to be able to do well at a certain task, what has to happen? Children aren't just born with those innate abilities. They have to be prepared for those things. And this is the path that I hope that you'll begin to, to think about as, as we go down. Preparing their heart for righteousness is what's important. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, it tells us there, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. We understand that the heart is involved in serving God in the way that is, that is pleasing before him and being able to put him first in our lives. You know, what is in the heart is what directs our lives. Consider this with me for just a moment as we kind of get the train rolling on this thought. It all starts with what's in our heart. Who we are and what we will do starts with what's in our heart. What's in the heart is what begins producing your thoughts. The thoughts that no one else knows but you and God. What's in your heart, what you see every day, what you hear every day, what you read, what you take in, that's what creates the thoughts that you have. And as those thoughts begin to manifest themselves, you begin to have a mindset about something, don't you? The thoughts that you have create what it is that you're thinking about, what your mindset is, and eventually that mindset comes out in what? In actions. You start to do things based on the mindset that you had that came from the thoughts that started with your heart. And those actions, as you do them over and over, what do they become? They become habits. And eventually, enough habits define you as a person and that's your character. So when you consider that all of that starts with the heart, how important is it that we prepare our heart to search and to seek after God? Timothy was told about this. In 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, as, as Paul talked about his faith, what did he say there? He says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. You see where it started. Timothy had time, and his parents helped him prepare his heart. All of these things that we've talked about so far refer to, to conditioning or preparing for serving God. And we must prepare because what is in our heart is what will come out. The Bible is evident in showing us those things. In Proverbs 23 and verse 6 through 8, notice as the writer talks about something else here, how we can gain that what's in the heart is truly what comes out here. He says, Do not eat bread with a man who is stingy. Do not desire his delicacies. For he is like one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. 
You will vomit up the morsels you have eaten and waste your pleasant words. Here's someone who says, sure, go ahead, but that's not what his heart really says. What's in our heart is what is eventually going to come out. Jesus says the same thing in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34 and 35. As he begins to rebuke some of those that are, that are there with him listening to this teaching, he says, You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasure brings forth good. An evil person out of his evil, evil treasure brings forth evil. What's in our heart is what's going to come out. So preparing our heart, we see throughout God's word, shows us, it shows us how important it is. Preparing the heart helps us to, to be able to put aside sin and renew. When there are things in there that shouldn't be in there, preparing our heart to seek God is what helps us put that out and find new. Consider 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 3, where Samuel says here to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart... Then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. What I hope you'll see as we've th thought about some of these introductory verses here in the Bible is this. That what we put in is what's going to come out. And if we don't spend time preparing our heart, then we'll have difficulty in serving God as we should. So how is it then that we need to have a heart prepared for God. Well, let's recognize a few things. First, we need to recognize that to how, in how we prepare our heart that our heart is like soil. And here's a familiar passage for us to consider as we think about this. In Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 3, down through verse 9, we find this parable of the sower. And as you read through this, something that, that we've read through before and we've used to make application in different ways, look at how many times Christ talks about the heart that's involved with these things. Read with me here in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 3. It says, And he told them many things in, in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And it goes on from there. So when you consider this parable of the sower, and then you go a few verses later, and you consider what it is that Jesus is trying to teach, you notice as you, as you transition from the actual parable to the explanation, at one point he talks about the heart and that the heart was dull of hearing. And that's one of the reasons that he spoke in parables, to, to get them thinking about these things and to use these real life examples for them to understand why it's so important to prepare the heart. We need to recognize that our heart is like soil. And as Jesus explained the parable, notice what he says here. Um, in verse 18, beginning in Matthew 13, he says, Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. So here's the idea of the word of God can affect our heart. He goes on to say this is what was sown along the path. As for the one that was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy and has no root in himself. But endures it for a while, and when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Here's an unprepared heart. One that wants to do what's right, but hasn't prepared for the trials and the tribulations that will come. Verse 22. For what was sown among the thorns, this one hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for the one that was on Sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and talks about the different levels in which that happens. So as we consider this this morning or this evening, which kind of heart do you have? Have you prepared yourself in order to be able to do what it is that God would ask of you? And again, as I try to make this real for myself, and, and maybe it does for you too, we, we're a family who has spent time in the past raising a garden. We try to grow some things that that we like and put it up and we enjoy doing that and as that comes about year after year it's interesting to watch how different things grow at different times and if I were to grab up some seed from the year before and I would go out to where we had the garden and I hadn't done any preparation and I just threw it out on the ground it's not going to do very well it's not going to yield very much 
And you can imagine, as you've probably seen some volunteer plants come up sporadically here and there, and you think about this parable, and you think about how that seed will disappear because there's nothing for it to take root in. The, the ground hasn't been prepared. And there's been many years, many years, that we've prepared the ground, and we've planted the seed, and life gets busy, and I look out the window and I see in a sea of weeds some of the plants sticking up out of there. And guess what? It didn't bear much fruit. We got a few things off of it, enough to eat, but not enough to, to put up into store like we wanted because we really didn't take care of it. We didn't prepare the ground. We didn't get the weeds out of there. But the years that, that we did well, where we were diligent about the weeding and, and putting things into the soil that were needed, as you can imagine, those crops did much better. That's such a simple example, and it's so true, and all of us can relate to that. But sometimes we don't relate to that when it comes to serving God. Sometimes we decide that we know, that we know what it is that we should do, and we have the knowledge of what God would have us to do, but we don't take the time to prepare and to study as God would ask us to do. Maybe I'll put it another way as, as we consider this. Most of you today will probably brush your teeth a couple of times. If you're an adult, I can't speak for the kids. But if you're an adult, most of us will do that today. And sometimes when we're busy, maybe that's a hassle. Right? And you're running out the door. But if you think about it, it's not something that you consider an option, is it? It's something that you know that you need to do to prepare yourself for the future if you still want to have teeth. Our dentist has a, a sign-up that says, only brush the teeth that you want to keep. So as you consider that, and you think about that that is something that you do without fail, even if it's something that isn't your favorite thing to do, but you know that it's necessary, we need to look at how we serve in other ways that way as well. That not just knowing that we need to give ourselves time with God's Word, but making it something that's not an option that we need to spend the time studying, that we need to spend the time learning, spend the time meditating, spend the time researching, getting out some study helps and knowing more about the Word of God. Spend the time going and talking with others. Spend the time visiting those who need help spiritually and physically. And all of those things to make us strong for the times when Satan might come against us. We need to spend the time preparing our heart. Realize that it's like that soil and what we put into it or how much we prepare is what will come out of it. We need to prepare our heart by putting aside self-reliance and immorality. And we see other examples of that in God's word. <clears throat> Think about Rehoboam for just a moment. I've got this passage up here in Second Chronicles and we'll, we'll read that here in just a moment. Think about Rehoboam. Sometimes this idea of seeking worldly power or looking inwardly to establish our strength and success is what we get caught up in doing. And Rehoboam is a good example of someone who did that. When you consider who he was, he was the first king of the, of the nation of Judah after the kingdom split. And you remember who his father was. Rehoboam's father was Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man to walk the face of the earth, given that wisdom by God. He was a wealthy man. He was a wise man. People came from miles around from other countries to hear his wisdom, and they know who he was. He knew who the Lord was, and certainly Rehoboam, Rehoboam knew that from his father. Or Rehoboam's grandfather, David, a man after God's own heart. If anyone would know the Lord and would know who he is and what one needs to do to have a successful life and to be pleasing, it should have been someone like Rehoboam. But as we read a couple of different times throughout his life, Rehoboam made some self-centered choices. He didn't prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Here in, in chapter 12, in the first part of that chapter, Shishak from Egypt comes up and comes against, them, comes against them because of the sins of the people and Rehoboam. And though the Lord eventually relents that, when you read this verse here, at the end of Rehoboam's life, this is the statement that is made about him. After all that he knew from his father and his grandfather, it says, and he did evil. Why? For he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. Rehoboam was more concerned about earthly wealth and power and success. And so, as we consider that, <clears throat> we realize that that kind of mindset can propagate 
if we allow it in our lives. Paul tells Timothy in, first sec- in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 13, while evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We want to prepare ourselves against that. We want to put aside self-reliance and immorality and realize that we need to depend upon God. Preparing our heart is finding associations that strengthen and commit us to the Lord instead of taking us away from the Lord. Consider here in 2 Chronicles, the 19th chapter, as we think about what's said about Jehoshaphat. Generally a good king, but notice the comments that are made about him here. It says, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned in safety to his house in Jerusalem, but Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, came out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath of the wrath has gone the wrath has gone out from from you against you from the Lord. I'll get it straight there in a minute. Uh, has gone out against you from the Lord. He wasn't making the right choices with some of the people that he was spending his time with. However, think about what else is said about him. Nevertheless, some good is found in you, for you destroyed the Ashtaroth out of the land, and you have set your heart to seek God. In general, that's the kind of person he was. And that stands out. And God sees that. And we need to see that as well. Some are captivated by materialism and immorality because they don't have a love of the truth that they should. They put themselves in the position of relying on themselves and looking towards immorality. And God speaks against that. We need to set our hearts in serving him. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, Because they refuse to love the truth, And so be saved, therefore God send them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false, in order that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What I hope that you'll see by some of these things is that if we're not setting our hearts to serve God and preparing ourselves that way, Satan's going to use what is in the world to draw us away. Just like he did with Rehoboam. Just like he tempted Jehoshaphat. Just like Paul told Timothy, there's other people out there who are bad who are going to keep getting worse. We must set our minds and prepare our hearts to serve God, lest we face that eternal punishment. Well, how do we go about that then? Well, one, another way is to delight in the law of the Lord. If we're going to prepare our hearts, then let's look at the positive part of it. Psalm chapter 1 and verse 2, one we know well. His delight, he's talking about the man of God here, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You go back to the example I talked about, the brushing of our teeth, or any other habit that we form that we want to produce something that's good. He talks here about the the law of the Lord and the man who meditates day and night. That's more than just a passing thought about what God would have us to do. That's more than just darkening the door of the church building one, two, or three times a week. That's more than just occasionally picking up our Bible and we think of, what did that passage say that I saw? Or seeing something on a sign as we go by. When it talks about meditating upon the law of the Lord day and night, that's giving ourselves to him. We thought this morning about what the glorified Christ might ask us. How's your heart? Do you meditate upon his word? Because that's going to make a difference in the condition of your heart. Paul says it in another way in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. He says there, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Delighting in what God would have us to meditate upon and think about and letting that consume our time, letting that be part of our energy is what will lead us to set our hearts in the right direction. The wisdom of Solomon in Proverbs says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Recall what what I said just a little while ago. From the heart come thoughts and a mindset and actions and habits and character. It all flows from the heart. We must keep that heart. We also need to recognize as we think about the how that we need to understand the war, the physical versus the spiritual. And realize what effect those kinds of things have on us. Depending on how we prepare our heart will determine how we approach everything else in life. It really will. And when you consider that, just again, step aside for a minute and think about it in in the physical realm. If you know someone who is an optimist and you know someone who is a cynic, consider how they approach life. You can present them both with the same situation and one of them is going to look for the best possible outcome or talk about the great things that could happen, and the other guy can look at the very same set of circumstances and have the most horrible things to say about it. 
We all know different people like that, don't we? Well, it has to do with how they're thinking about things. So if you want your heart to be in the right place, you want to be able to answer Christ in the right way, you must prepare it. Understand there's a difference in how we look at things. There's a warring going on between the spiritual man and the physical man. The physical is what Satan will use to distract us, to misdirect us, to make us think that, that something else is more important or more urgent or more reasonable or more responsible. But we need to be focused on the spiritual things. And the scriptures bear that out in so many different places and in so many ways. Take that into your mind and heart as we consider it tonight. Romans 7 and verse 22 is one place where Paul, Paul, a great apostle, a great man, well-educated, well well-learned, we read his writings and we, we understand some of the deep things that he has said to the, to the Christians of that time. But yet, look at what Paul says that he even wrestled with. He says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells upon my members. If you go on into the next verse, he talks about, Oh, what a wretched man that I am, as he tries to, to, talk, to think about both of these things together. Here in, in Romans chapter 8, he brings it up again as he talks about the difference in walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit and living in that way. Where's your mindset? How do you think about the things that come up every day? How do you think about the direction that your life is going to take? For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. When you look at that, which side do you want to be on? To be on the right side we must do the things that put our hearts in that condition. Understand the physical is going to pull us one way and the spiritual takes us another. When you consider the, the fruit of the Spirit, as Paul says this again in another letter to another group of Christians in Galatians chapter 5. We know this one well, but, but read it with me again and let it, let it permeate you as you think about how you are going to set your mind, how you're going to prepare your heart. He says, but I say, walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Understand this difference, this warring back and forth. He goes on in, in verse 22 to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, that which is good, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. We read over those sometimes, but stop for a moment and say to yourself and look at these things, is this part of who I am and if it's not it's not something that you can just turn a switch on it's something that you'll need to send, spend time preparing for and setting your mind towards we think back about Ezra and the task that he had ahead of him to restore to make reforms in Jerusalem with the people who are coming back from captivity and all of the the things that were coming against them and standing in their way he had to prepare himself he had to set his mind he set his heart to do those things and and we need to think about those things as well. Is the physical man being fed more than the spiritual man? That's a question for you to answer. Well, we've thought about how, but why? Why do we want to have a heart that is prepared for God? Why is that necessary? Well, we go back and, and think about what that passage in, in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10 said. He talked there about seeking the law of the Lord or to search out the law of the Lord. What he very simply means there, to seek the law of the Lord, means to be able to study and to know what it is that God would have us to do. What will we be studying for? We spend a lot of time preparing for things and studying, in that sense, for things here in this life. I know I have um, throughout my college career, throughout things for work, and many of you have had those experiences as well. And we can become quite accomplished in things of this world, and we can use the natural talents and abilities that God has given us. Do you give as much time to the godly things as you do to the spiritual things? That's one thing to ask. Paul says to Timothy, do your best, or be diligent, 
Or if you go back to the King James Version, study, very simply. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. How do you get to that point? How do you get to be someone who is not ashamed of of the word of truth because you are handling it rightly? Well, it's the time that you're willing to put there. It's are you willing to seek the law of the Lord? This involves more than what we generally think of in just a school sense of studying. It means that we need to add things to our faith. We need to build on it. It's layers that make our heart prepared and help us to be able to seek God as we should. You remember 2 Peter chapter chapter 1 and those few verses that begin there in verse 5 down through 11 that we're so familiar with where he, where Peter says for he talks about there for this very reason make every effort to supplement your faith. And he starts talking about what we might add. He talks about virtue and knowledge and self-control and godliness and brotherly love. And as you get down into verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 1, notice what he says. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. For in this, for, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, What we see as we look into God's word and we think about this idea of searching and studying God's law, and that's why we need to prepare our heart, Jesus tells us that if we will ask of him, that he will give us that which we need. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7 talks about that. We're looking for opportunities. We're looking for knowledge. We're looking for ways to serve. Ask of God. We need to study and to know those things. Even our our faith is based on a recognition that that we will be rewarded when we seek him diligently, when we put forth a great effort, our faith will grow. And we realize this idea of seeking him diligently, that's what Ezra was doing, that's what we're talking about now, that's what the Hebrew writer tells us builds our faith. He says, without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever draws near to God, or whoever would draw near to God, must believe that he exists, and what else? That he rewards those who seek him. Some translations talk, have diligently seek him. There's this idea continually throughout God's word that we are promised that if we seek his law diligently, if we seek him diligently, that an honest heart will be rewarded with the things that he will provide. Why? Why have a heart prepared for God? To do the will of God. That seems like such a simple concept, but unless we are willing to do the will of God, then the knowledge that we have is of no use to us. And you probably know some individuals, I know that I do, who know a lot of things about the Bible. I have some friends who, are, who probably know more about some of the facts and history of the Bible than I do. But they don't practice those things. And what does that say about our heart? We can know a lot about a lot of things, but if we don't use it, what good is it to us? What does Christ say? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? We know what the ending verse is in verse 23. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Obeying what God wants of us. Doing it is the point of setting our heart in the right way and seeking it out. If Christ were to ask us, how's your heart? And we say, with a, with a mind full of knowledge, it's in great shape, but we're not doing anything. How does that reflect on what he would have us do? James chapter 1 and verse 22. This thought is borne out in what James tells us over and over. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Let's not deceive ourselves. James teaches us there that if we're a hearer and not a doer, it's like a man who looks in the mirror and forgets what kind of man he was. Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed by God. The last thing that we'll think about here tonight is, as we think about why a heart needs to be prepared for God, is to be able to teach it. When you go back to that verse in Ezra and it talked about what he did, that he set his heart uh, or he, he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to teach it or to do it and to teach it. There's a purpose that goes with that. 
And when you consider Ezra, Ezra was involved in teaching. And you look in Ezra, the sixth chapter, it talks about the statutes and ordinances in Israel, that he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses. And as he proclaimed these things to the people, he was trying to restore them to the law that God wanted them to follow after, that they had forsaken for so long. And when you go on and read in other places, he talked about the people coming together and they stood up as Ezra Ezra was ready to read the law. He was an expert in the words and the commandments of the Lord and the statutes of Israel. Ezra 7 and verse 11 talks about that. In all those things, we realize that he was skilled because he was able to teach it to others. He was able to bring them to God in the way that God wanted at that time. And we need to find ourselves able to do that as well. We studied a couple of weeks ago in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 how the writer looked at those who weren't where they should be. He talked there that they ought to, by this time, they ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. And he explained why that's important. And in verse 14, he talks about that the solid food is for the mature who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. The way that you have your powers of discernment trained by constant practice as it relates to teaching is being able to bring this good news that we have to others. That admonition is given to Timothy by Paul. This is a powerful verse, though a short one. As Paul writes this letter to Timothy, you think about 2 Timothy, one of the last things that that we know about that Paul wrote before he lost his life for the cause of Christ. And these are some of the things that he says to Timothy. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul knew that his life was going to come to an end. And throughout that letter, He encourages Timothy to be strong in the faith, to proclaim his faith, to teach others, to spread the gospel. Paul didn't shy away from doing that just because of what was happening to him, and he encouraged Timothy to do the same. And we need to do the same as well. So tonight, as you might think about some of these things, you consider what we find about the heart and having a heart that is prepared for God. Consider what the Savior might ask of you. If your heart is where it needs to be, how is your heart tonight? Knowing what it says about studying God's word diligently, have you determined to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only? Can you deal honestly with God's word? Can you look at yourself and say, I'm preparing myself to serve the living God in whatever way He wants me to. I'm ready for the trials that might come my way because I have prepared myself to be useful in the kingdom of God. And if you are, that is fantastic. And you're an encouragement to all of us. If you need to change something, though, to get your heart in the right place, won't you do that tonight? Can we help you do that in some way? If there's a way that we can help you get your heart in the right place, whether that's coming to Christ for the first time and committing your life to Him, or maybe you just... Need someone to pray with you and to share your struggle and to help you and strengthen you. We're willing to do that as well. Let us know, please, how we can help you tonight. Put your heart in the right place as together now we stand and as we sing.